Shalom Uvraha. Welcome to Monday School. I invite you to join me in turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll also be moving into chapter 6. It'll be chapter 5, starting with verse 11, and then uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Before we start, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this day, for every opportunity that being in your word affords us to, to learn to think your thoughts after you. We are grateful that you count us worthy to, to embrace the word, that you pass the word down through generations and that we are recipients of the blessed privilege of thinking your thoughts after you, of learning your words after you spoke them, we thank you for sending Christ into the world. And as we contemplate your goodness and grace, we ask as well your touch upon those who need a special touch from you. We think of Don and Judy Finehour and ask your blessing upon them. Um, Barbara's neighbor that has a physical difficulty, would you intercede in that uh, and, and, and bring healing in a way that opens people's eyes to your majesty, your power. For uh, Mike's sister-in-law, Teresa, we ask your divine touch. For our country, as we think about all that we have been through, all that we are going through, and we are keenly aware that we as a people need you and we need for there to be a widespread awareness of just how, how poverty-stricken we are when we try to move through life without acknowledging you as Lord. And so it is that we do praise your name. Thank you for sending Jesus. And now help us as we read your word, as we study it, to understand what uh, you are, uh, the message that you are sending. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, the topic is reconciliation. Now that is a word that uh, gets used in all kinds of settings, but when we think in terms of being reconciled to God, that it's a reminder that since the garden and humanity's lack of faithfulness, that we have been at odds with God. And we are seeking to be restored. And that's what reconciliation is all about. Now, when we get to Chapter 5, verse 11, we're going to read 
these words, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. And in the version that I am reading from, that, that, that verse starts with a therefore. And though this is a trite statement, uh, it holds true, and I've heard much more qualified preachers than I say this exact phrase. They say, whenever you see the word therefore in Scripture, you need to back up and read the what precedes so that you know what it's there for. A little bit corny, but it kind of helps you remember. Whenever you see that word, it should be a trigger to look back. And so I'd like to share a few verses with you before we launch into the lesson. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we read, Even if our gospel is veiled, and you'll remember Last week, I believe it was, we were talking about how uh, a veil was over Moses' face because it, it was there to shield the Israelites from seeing the glory depart from his face. That uh, the, the, It was there, first of all, to shield them from the glory but then also to shield them from, from seeing it disappear so that they didn't slip into some, some thinking as if uh, somehow because the glory was departing that that meant that Moses was not worthy to be followed. Now, back to what I was reading, that even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. By implication, then, he's saying it is unveiled to those who have found new life in Jesus Christ. It is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Did you ever wonder why there are some people who, confronted with all of the, the data they really need to embrace Christ, they dismiss it? They walk away. How could you do that? And here's the answer right here, that it is the God, small g, the God of this world has blinded them. So when people say, I just don't see it, they're telling you the truth. They don't see it because they have been blinded by one who is the father of all lies. Now, as we move into the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, I'd like to warm you up to our, our passage with this. He says, We know that the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, that, that if our tent is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In other words, what's the worst that somebody can do to you in this world? They'll kill you. And when they do, they release you from this earthly tent, and you proceed to a building in the heavenlies that is eternal. So fear not, little flock, even when you face the worst that this world can, 
can dish out. 4, verse 2 of chapter 5, In this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What a prospect that somewhere in the future, and you've heard me say it this way before, we walk down a crooked path in life that is filled with all kinds of twists and turns, and the reality is that one day, you will get to a turning point. You will take that corner, a blind corner, and there you'll be face to face with Jesus Christ. So that's what we have to look forward to. So that being the case, verse 8, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, let's jump back into the scripture that we are studying this week. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 11. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. That's why we're here, to try to persuade others. And you'll notice if the Apostle Paul, if the best he could do was to say we try to persuade others, that means he didn't have an absolute surefire way to persuade people of the good news. That you're still dealing with people who are free moral agents. And that means that they have the privilege of either accepting or rejecting the truth. So, here is Paul. He says that we're not trying, as he's talking about per, trying to persuade others, what we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again. In other words, Paul has had to do that in the past to commend himself, to let people know what he has gone through and why he preaches what he preaches, that we're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. And Paul's reminding us that it's not what you see that matters. It's what's in your heart. That's one of the reasons why it's impossible for me to tell exactly what's in your heart. Impossible for you to tell exactly what's in my heart. It certainly can't be seen but, oh, we do know when, when God is upon the scene and our, our hearts respond to him, there is no doubt in our minds that he abides, that he lives within, and that he is not only resident, but he is president. Amen? So... Moving on, verse 14. 
For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Your death is tied up in the death of Jesus Christ. And so it is that you don't have to worry about the death blow. That you do not have to worry about what is involved as you exit this life and go on to the next. That that's already been dealt with on the cross and you can rest in the assurance that your life is in God's hands and was placed there by Jesus Christ himself. I had skipped down uh, accidentally and somewhere, somebody somewhere along the line had accused Paul of being out of his mind. And he said, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. And in essence, what he's saying there is, I'm crazy about God. That if somebody thinks that I'm crazy, they're right, because I am crazy for him and about him. He has done everything for me that I need for life and godliness, and I will stand on his provision and proclaim his goodness and his grace. Verse 15, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now, this makes it clear when he says we should no longer live for ourselves that when we are alive in Christ, that we don't just get our ticket punched and then live life on our own terms. That when we are alive in Christ, everything has changed. Everything. And that means that our want-tos are subject to, to Christ. Our want-tos are subject to the will of God, and everything is filtered through his will and his word. Now, that being the case, in verse 16, he says... So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. What that means is as you're walking down the street, there is no such thing as a, an insignificant uh, encounter that you are placed where you are placed. You are doing what you are doing so that you can walk in the light of who Christ is with confidence that God is ordering your steps, that there is no such thing as an accidental encounter that your day is filled with divinely set appointments and that sometimes, sadly, we're not listening. We, we miss appointments that we didn't even know that we had. But there are other times when 
when the appointment has been made and uh, the other afternoon I was sitting in somebody's office and a guy walked past and he knew both of us and he said, hey, I've got a question for you. What does it mean? And I about fell out of my chair when he asked this. He says, what is Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? I didn't know this guy knew that there was a 1 Corinthians, much less for him to have a question about chapter 14. And it turns out that, and I haven't had a chance to investigate further, but but this guy is a straight shooter, uh, but he was the last person in the world that I expected to have a Bible question. And he and his wife have been attending a church and studying the Bible, and he's got questions. And that means there's a fertile field, and I can anticipate in the days ahead that there will be additional questions. So it's exciting to know that when I go to work, I've got my work appointments, and then I've got some divine appointments, many of which I don't know anything about yet, but they're coming. They're coming. Isn't that great? So, all of this, oh, let me back up. We're in verse 16. We regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. There are some people who just dismiss Jesus out of hand. They regard him as a great historical figure, but nothing more than that. And uh, uh, Paul is saying, I used to think that way, but no more. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. That's a different translation than many of us are used to seeing, that if, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. And whichever translation you pick, uh, there, there, there's not a significant difference in what's going on there that, that Paul is saying. When Jesus is the center of who you are and what you do, everything changes. It's as if the world has been made over brand new. I'm not the only one who has experienced this, but, but when you are alive in Christ as a new believer, you step outside and you see the sky and it's never been as blue that uh, many of the things that are, are outward and, quote, normal, are suddenly abnormal because you see them in a totally different way because Jesus has made all things new. The new has come, the old has gone, that the new is right here. And all this, verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God has reconciled us to himself. And to be reconciled means to be put in right relationship that God has been there all the time with his arms open. But if we have been unable, unwilling, unwilling to enter into God's open arms, 
that we've missed out on the reconciliation. This reconciliation, you can think in terms of Jesus understood it when he told the parable of the prodigal son, and that when he returns home, he does so saying, I know that there are slaves in my father's house that are living better than I am. And, and as he came home, his father, instead of standing there with a list of offenses that he had done, welcomed him. And uh, there is, is no record of him requiring a cleanup. Now, don't misinterpret what I'm saying here, but he says, bring him the robe, the best robe. And the implication is over this dirty boy who had been wallowing in the pig pen, the father placed this beautiful, ornate robe that sent the message that this, this one, is part of the family. That that's reconciliation. That he's back in. He's back home. And there were no, uh, that, that any repercussions that came up started in the heart of the son, not in the mouth of the father that he welcomed him and embraced him and kissed him. This my son was dead and he is alive. That's reconciliation, restoration. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. If you have been reconciled, then you have a ministry, and that is to let others know that there is a way that they can come home to the Father. And what God was reconciling, the, the fact that, excuse me, not what God, but that, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Isn't that great? God's not a bean counter. He's not trying to figure out whether or not you deserve to get in. No longer counting people's sins against them, that he has committed to us the message of reconciliation that the debt has been canceled and that we are free in Christ. We are therefore, if we have been reconciled, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. What is an ambassador? That is somebody who is a citizen of a different country who lives not in his home country, but in another country to sort of serve as a funnel, as a passageway, that this is this uh, ambassador lets those who want to visit the other country, perhaps even move to the other country to know what they're in for, that he knows the details and that we are ambassadors of Christ, that we are no longer living in our home country. Our home country is waiting for our return, and that one day we will re-enter that country. And we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Paul says it's as if 
And the reality is that's exactly what's going on. God is making his appeal through us. And therefore, Paul goes on to say, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You want to be satisfied with the way life is working out for you? And I'm not promising that it's going to be a smooth skate all the way. But I can promise you that it is an adventure that will be well worth every investment you put into it. That if you are reconciled to God, what, what does that look like exactly? Paul says, be reconciled to God. Then in verse 21, God made him who had no sin. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what reconciliation is all about. Then, in 2 Corinthians 6, starting with verse 1, as God's co-workers, you get that? As an ambassador, you are now a co-worker with God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to, to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. How is it that you came to be where you are from where you used to be that in the time of my favor, God says, I heard you. God was listening. His heart was touched by your situation. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. Now, when is the time of favor? When is the day of salvation? It's now. It is here. And God is listening. And he stands ready to help you. I not only invite you, I implore you to cry out to him. See, Paul goes on to say, I, bet, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. And the implications of that, the wages of sin is death. God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of the tree, you shall die. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Confess your sins. Turn to him. And allow the floodgates of his grace and mercy to be opened in your heart. That you will be cleansed and prepared for a full reconciliation not on the basis of what you've done, but on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
in his name. Amen. Amen.